On behalf of the Bridgewater Historical Society, I'd like to welcome you today to our program on Calvin Coolidge by Vermont historian Howard Coffin, which I'm sure none of you know. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank Alice Paglia and Bridgewater Grange for allowing us to use this wonderful wall. I also want to let you know that Woodstock Community Television is recording today's program, so if you have friends or family that couldn't make it today, please let them know. They can check out woodstockcommunitytelevision.org, or we will have the link on our website, bridgewaterhistory.org. Um, case of emergency, exits, front and rear. Uh, please silence your electronic devices. Restrooms are over there. Uh, if you haven't signed uh, our sign-up sheet, I would ask you before you leave to do that. Or just we have a, kind of a number of what's going on. I would also like to invite you to visit the Bridgewater Historic Society. We're located at 12 Bridgewater Road in Bridgewater. Um, we're open the second and fourth Saturdays of the month now to the beginning of October from 2 to 4. Uh, excuse me, from 10 to 2. <laughs> <laughs> I should read what I write. <laughs> Our exhibit this year, in recognition of the 100th anniversary of the swearing in of Calvin Coolidge as, pre as president, is the message gets through. August 2nd, 1923, Nellie Perkins, telephone switchboard operator at the Southern Vermont Telephone Company in Bridgewater, received an urgent message for then Vice President Calvin Coolidge. There was no phones at the Coolidge homestead. So she had her husband, W.A. Perkins, who, by the way, is the grandfather of our own Jeanette Sawyer, um, to go up to deliver the message. W.A. jumps in his 1918-8. I had to look up what that was myself. <laughs> to Plymouth Notch to deliver the message to Calvin Coolidge that President Harding had died. Of course, then setting in the motion for him to become our 30th president of the United States. Our exhibit actually has those switchboards uh, on display, as well as photographs and other memorabilia uh, of that event. Um, also, the story of Southern Vermont Telephone, which W.A. Perkins started. And we also have memorabilia from you know, Calvin Coolidge in our events here. Please stop by. Uh, our next event will be on, on August 7th on the First Lady Grace Coolidge by Cynthia Bittinger. Hope I didn't mispronounce that. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce and please give a warm welcome to today's speaker, Howard Coffin. Well, Jeanette, they stole our punchline. <laughs> yes, her grandfather took that earth-shaking message from Bridgewater to Plymouth. But the reason I'm here today is that Je Jeanette called me in the summer. She always does. I love coming here over here. And she called me about this, and uh, we we discovered some common ground and the decision was made to talk about Coolidge because the phone message that came from Washington headed for Plymouth was relayed through Woodstock <laughs> by the night operator who was Wallace Coffin, my father. <laughs> <laughs> so, but for the two of us, our, our ancestry, Coolidge might not have ever found out. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to be back here. I have, you know, I come here and God, I've met a couple people today. I didn't think I know that, I don't think I know that they were, what this do? Oh, I'm sorry. I took my microphone off. Or I took my coat off. 
uh, you know, that, that I'm related to. You know, uh, my grandfather was one of 12 kids and uh, married, all those kids married into huge families. Ward Bulls, you know, and oh my God. And uh, after I got out of the Army, I know, you've probably heard this story. After I got out of the Army, I came home and go to work for the Round Herald. And uh, I had to live with my folks for a month. <laughs> And I was out one night, I came in at 2 o'clock in the morning, my mother was off. <laughs> and that didn't make me very happy, you know. I said, Mom, what are you doing out? I'm my like, God, I said, I'm, you know, I'm 24 years old, and uh, I've been in the Army, and, uh, and she said, well, she said, I just, before I go, I went to bed, I, I wanted to make sure that you know that that young lady you were out with tonight is your cousin. I had no idea. <laughs> so I said her name, a lot of you would know it, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> He's still with us. <laughs> well, Calvin Coolidge. Boy, I've forgotten so much about Calvin Coolidge, but I'll do my best. I am a Yankee Doodle Bench. A Yankee doodle do or die. Yes. A real live relative of Uncle Sam, born on the 4th of July. <laughs> Jimmy Cagney. <laughs> Did that in a, yeah. in a movie made in the, around 1940, I think. Jimmy Cagney. Oh, Jimmy Cagney, by the way, came to Woodstock. He was at, do you remember Mrs. Winifred Hardy, who lived on the Pomfret Road, she had an antique shop? When she closed down, they had a huge auction in Cagney. Yes, born on the 4th of July. Calvin Coolidge was born on the 4th of July, 1872. The only American president thus far to have been born on the 4th of July. What a political advantage. <laughs> oh, that's gone. I mean, you couldn't ask for more, and not only that, but he was born in Plymouth Notch, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And then he was sworn in by his father. I mean, of course, that happened 100 years ago, you know, this coming August 3rd. Uh, I mean, it was a press secretary's dream. You know, I was a press secretary to Jim Jeffords, and I never could get him to do anything very exciting. <laughs> he always wanted to just get things done. <laughs> All the other senators were showing off, and Jim was getting things done. That's the way he was. I love it. Anyway, we'll come back to all this. Just for a minute, let me, there's going to be a series of stories here. In 1976, when the nation's 200th birthday came around, I was a reporter for the Rough and Arrow. And on that July 4th, the man, I was the state reporter. The managing editor said, oh, Howard, go and do what you want on the day. Just give us a couple of stories. <laughs> so I went to the uh, Revolutionary War reenactment at Hubbardton. I went to a uh, country concert at Bird's, Bird's Eye Mountain in Castleton with Vassar Clements and Earl Scruggs. Wow. <laughs> 15,000 people there. But in the morning, I went to Plymouth Notch because I was going to interview John Coolidge, the president's son. Now, we, the Herald had local correspondents in many towns that, were, that alerted us of news breaking, you know, and the one in Ludlow's name was Mary Barton, and her husband was Howard Barton, and he had he was an electrician. He had his own business. Mary Barton was a beautiful woman, and whenever there was a really contentious selectmen's meeting in Ludlow, she would call up, and I would go down and help her because she was a little worried about things, you know. So I'd go down and I'd do the hollering if it needed to be done. Anyway, she called me the day before the nation's birthday and said, do you mind if I go to Plymouth with you? I'd like to see it. I said, sure, Mary. So she came over, and at 11 o'clock we were there when church let out, and a crowd came out in front, and there was John Coolidge. I'd never met him. And I finally got a chance to get beside him, and I said, excuse me, Mr. Coolidge, I'm Howard Coffin. 
from the Reverend Darrell, and he said yes. And I said, I'd like to ask you what your father would have thought of the country today, 200 years old. He said, well, he said, I think, he said, I think he'd been pretty pleased. The country's in good shape, I think. Uh, he would have liked it, except for one thing. The debt. He wouldn't have liked the national debt. And then he looked at Mary. And he said, are you Mary Barton? And she said, yes, Mr. Coolidge. He said, is your husband Howard Barton? And she said, yes, Mr. Coolidge. She said, well, he came over two weeks ago to fix my pump. And it's broken down, and I paid him $8 to do that. <laughs> I want you to tell him to get back here and fix it right. Poor Mary turned 15 shades of red. There are 100 people around, and she just walked away. She didn't know what to do. It was not until I had filed my story several days later that I realized that I had just seen Coolidge. That was pure Coolidge, what I heard from John. And it was only years later that I wrote that. I didn't include it in the story. But that tightness, uh, that practicality, even on the nation's 200th birthday, was absolutely pure Coolidge. Well, let me begin here with a quote from the Coolidge autobiography. By the way, Coolidge wrote one of the great books any president ever wrote, his, his memoirs. Oh, my God. Listen to this. During the summer vacation, my father and I went to the dedication of the Bennington Battle Monument. This is 1891. It was a most elaborate ceremony with much oratory, followed by a dinner and more speaking, with many bands of music and a long military parade. I heard President Harrison, who was the first president I had ever seen. He made an address. As I looked on him and realized that he personally represented the glory and dignity of the United States, I wondered how it felt to bear so much responsibility and little thought that I should ever know. <laughs> let's for a moment here, let's define our subject here, Calvin Coach. Born on the 4th of July, 1872, in a room behind the store that his father owned, over here at the Notch. How far are we from the Notch? Seven miles? Yeah. Not far. No. Uh, Calvin Coolidge's uh, life was touched with sadness. His mother died when, she was, uh, when he was 12 years old. She was a beautiful woman, a wonderful woman, apparently. Listen to what he wrote in the autobiography about her. There was a touch of mysticism and poetry in her nature, which made her love to gaze at the purple sunsets and watch the evening stars. It seemed as though the rich green tinges of foliage and the blossoms of flowers came to her in springtime. And in the autumn, it was for her that the mountainsides were struck with crimson and with gold. Wow. Phew. Five years later, Calvin's sister Abby died when he was 17. His father was an operator. His father was an operator. He's a big, tall guy. He owned the store. He sold land. He served for a term in the Vermont Senate. He worked for one of the governors. He was an insurance salesman. He worked on the roads. I mean, he, he was a constable. He was always at the courthouse down there in Woodstock. He made a lot of money. Now, Coolidge was schooled in the stone house at the Notch, which no longer stands. Went to Black River Academy for high school. When he, one of his big, the big days of his life, he always said, was the day he went from Plymouth down to Ludlow to uh, Black River Academy. He also said that the whole wagon ride down there, his father didn't say a word to him. Hmm. Incidentally, years ago, I researched a book on Coolidge, the writer. I never wrote it. Should have. I found a short story that he had written as a teenager about an Indian girl who lived... Now, if you go from Plymouth to Ludlow, if you go down Route 100, you go by Echo Lake, and if you look to your left, there's a little island. Well, this is what the story was about. 
It's about an Indian maiden who lived on that island, and she warned a group of uh, settlers that, they, that an Indian raid was coming. That's what the story's about. There's also kind of a little love story. See, Polish is a teenager when he writes it. Here's a, here's a quote from that story I found. Tis long ago since the whistle of the loom reverberated, reverberated from mountain to mountain over the flashing waters of Echo Lake. Tis long ago yet since the moccasined Iroquois dipped the light paddle in the silvery depths as he glided over the rippling surface surface in his birch bark canoe. But though the Indian warrior is gone from the lake, yet like the sun that he so often saw sinking among the golden clouds of the western hills, he has left behind him a poetic afterglow that still lights up the mellow haze of the past. Pretty darn good writing for a teenager, I would say. Um, so Coolidge, Black River Academy. Then he goes to St. Johnsbury Academy for two months to prepare for Amherst. One of his Ooh. teachers had got him interested in Amherst. He gets accepted at Amherst. Uh, he spends four years at Amherst. He's a fairly good student. He's a, he's a loner until his senior year. He, it's only then he gets involved, but couldn't get into the clubs, the fraternities. Uh, that was for rich kids. Uh, after he graduates, he goes to uh, Waterbury and interviews with a law firm up there, but they don't want him. <laughs> so he signs on in Northampton with a law firm, just across the Connecticut River from Amherst. And he becomes, uh, he reads law with a law firm in Northampton, and he does well. And in 1898, he gets involved in Northampton politics, he gets elected to the city council, and then in 1905 he meets a Vermont girl working in Northampton, Grace Goodhue from Burlington. Father was an officer on the steamboats that plied Lake Champlain. A beautiful woman. My goodness. Grace Goodhue, full of fun, uh, and uh, they get it off. They hit it off, are soon married, and they have uh, two sons, John and Calvin. First, uh, John, born in 1906. They lived in uh, Northampton and half of a duplex on Massasoit Street. In 1907, he's elected to the Massachusetts House. In 1909, he's elected mayor of Northampton. 1911, he's elected to the Massachusetts Senate. Elected president of the Massachusetts Senate in 1914 and lieutenant governor in 1915 to 18 and governor of Massachusetts in 1918. How in hell did he do it? <laughs> it's a mystery to me. I mean, it's one thing to get elected in Vermont, but Massachusetts, that is tough stuff. Massachusetts politics is really hard. I think the secret to it is that a couple of wealthy men uh, became his allies. I, they saw in him the talent, a guy named Stearns, who was a multi-millionaire, backed him for years and years, and he had a lot of political acumen. Years ago, when I was a reporter, I covered a meeting of the New England governors Somewhere in Massachusetts, the governors at the time, this is with, with you older people, this will resonate. The go governors, Ella Grasso, Connecticut, Meldrum Thompson, <laughs> New Hampshire, uh, Edwin Muskie, uh, Tom Salmon in Vermont. But the keynote speaker at this uh, event was the head of the state colleges in Massachusetts, Billy Bolger. Billy Bolger, <laughs> former, former Speaker of the House in Massachusetts, brother of Whitey Bolger. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget the, and uh, I mean, Billy Bolger was really talented. I mean, he was, 
he had a great sense of humor. He had a great Irish tenor. I mean, he, and he gave a great speech that day. And then there was a question and answer. And, and the jokes were going back and forth between the press and, and, and but all of a sudden, one of the Massachusetts reporters asked him a question he didn't like. And his head swung around, and I never saw a look in somebody's eyes. <laughs> My God, it was terrifying. And there was, was Whitey Bulger right there. <laughs> and uh, that's how tough Massachusetts politics can be. I'll tell you, I don't know how cool it is. You know, he almost didn't say a word some days. Anyway. <laughs> In 1919, when Coolidge's governor, the Massachusetts, the Boston police, try to go on strike. And Coolidge opposes it, saying there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. And he becomes a national figure, absolutely overnight. At the Republican National Convention in 1922, Coolidge expects to be nominated president. Doesn't happen. Harding gets the nomination. Coolidge has said that his, his uh, workers at the convention didn't do the job they should have done. And then August 3rd, 1923, in the night before Harding dies, and uh, Coolidge becomes president, sworn in by his father. Coolidge serves the rest of Harding's term and then is re-elected by a landslide in 1924, serves through 1928, and then while vacationing in South Dakota, he issues a statement, I do not choose to run. There's still debate about what that meant. He still had some hopes, I think, of being president. <laughs> My association with Plymouth began in the 1940s, Sunday rides with my grandmother Coffin to historic places. Of course, there was no, Coolidge had been dead two years when I first went there, I think. So I probably, I, I wouldn't have, I was born in 42, I probably went there in 47, maybe something like that. The place fascinated me. <coughs> the fact that a, the, the Coolidge presence just loomed there. I mean, and it affected all of us kids in school. How many times did I hear a teacher say, well, I guess if Calvin Coolidge could be elected president, you could pass that test. <laughs> <laughs> there were always, you know, these little references. In uh, 1985, I went to Plymouth to interview people who knew Coolidge. And I wrote this magazine article. Pass it around. There's a good picture of John Coolidge on the cover. It's funny how the photographer got him to stand where he did. Look at the road sign there. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few quotes from this article I wrote. Well, these are people that knew Coolidge. Violet Michael. Do you remember Violet Michael? She was. Uh, her, her husband-to-be, the morning that Coolidge uh, was uh, sworn in and left for Washington, her husband-to-be was driving an old rickety milk wagon down the hill toward the graveyard in Plymouth Knox. And he came around the corner, and played, the thing didn't have hardly any brakes. And down by the cemetery was this immense black limousine. <clears throat> and he knew he couldn't stop the car. And he said the rest of his life he never knew how he got by that car, but it was Coolidge on his way to Washington to become president, <laughs> visiting his mother's grave. He stopped there to see his mother's grave. And according to the Michaels, he darn near got killed with that, by that big truck. I never knew that before. <laughs> uh, Violet Michaels, she remembered going to the one-room school in Plymouth Notch, and one day she looked out the window and she saw Calvin Coolidge running up the road. And then in about five minutes, a bunch of young men came running behind him. It was the Secret Service. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to get away. The night that uh, Coolidge was sworn in, uh, Violet uh, uh, Pelkey, I thought she was 14 that night, 
She ran messages from the store to the uh, homestead, where the store, there was a phone in the store, you see. And uh, when it was all done, and, uh, the sun came up and Coolidge was leaving, he gave her a dollar. <laughs> and he said it was the first dollar he'd paid anyone since he became president. <laughs> and she said she had a safe deposit box. Wow. <laughs> uh, one cool, one uh, Plymouth uh, Herman Pelkey remembered that he saw uh, Coolidge going off uh, into the woods one day with a rifle, accompanied by his press secretary. And, and, the, and, and Pelkey, when, he, when Coolidge came back, Pelkey said, what are you doing, Mr. President? And he said, I went hunting. That, that woodchuck bothering me. <laughs> and uh, Pelkey said, did you get it? And Coolidge said, you heard me shoot, didn't you? <laughs> his, his press secretary said he didn't even come close to it. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Hoskinson said Coolidge loved to sit out on the steps of the porch and talk to people about local things. He liked to know how local people were doing. Uh, another uh, local person said Grace Coolidge loved to attend dances in the room up over the store. Her, husband, uh, her son John would go with her and dance with her. She would dance with anybody who wanted to dance with her. Calvin wouldn't come across the road. <laughs> and Calvin would would schedule fishing trips in the summer uh, with a local with a local man and uh, Coolidge would take it on Tinker Burke over near the Shrewsbury Road there. And Coolidge would go ahead of this guy and he'd catch a couple of trout. The guy would come behind him and ten minutes later he'd get his women. Coolidge wasn't a fisherman. He tried. Another Plymouth resident said that Coolidge used to walk to the cemetery often. And Coolidge, in fact, used to go to the cemetery in the middle of the night and sleep on his mother's grave when he was a kid. It was so lonesome. And then, Woman remembered going to the funeral of their son John, who died while they were in the hideout in the White House. We went up to the funeral. He looked kind of drawn. Grace held up well. And then I interviewed John Coolidge. John Coolidge, I'll just read this. Listen to this. Listen to this. John Coolidge recently called the time. Uh, of the funeral it was the only time I ever saw my father break down when they took my brother out of the White House. He broke down a little bit. Coolidge well understands that many of Vermont's son has come to accept down the years. Loving fathers don't have to gush with praise, hugs and tears to be loving fathers. Coolidge said the man the poet knew was the father we knew. Vermonters who have deep feelings don't often show them. Coolidge said his father was strict with us boys. He said he was rather stern. He didn't put up with much nonsense. And then, this is the quote that I think that made this article. My father wasn't palsy walsy with anyone. Oh. <laughs> Now, that one hit me when I heard it. Well, John Coolidge. John Coolidge was a troubled young man. His brother Calvin, who was a cute kid, looked like his mother. Uh, uh, John was tall and looked like his grandfather. Uh, was the favorite of his father. Calvin was. And uh, he died a horrible death in the White House. He got a blister playing tennis and it, he got a blood infection. 
and he lingered several days of absolute agony. And uh, he pled with his father, can't you do something, you know? And uh, Coolidge said that the, the glory of the presidency went out of it when his son died. And then, of course, uh, Calvin was devastated by the, uh, the death of his mother, and then his stepmother and his grandparents were so close to him, and his sister. One of my dear friends from my Dartmouth days was Edward Connery Latham, who was Robert Frost's editor, and uh, he was a great friend of John Coolidge, and they owned the cheese factory together for some time. He wrote, he edited a book of the letters between Calvin Coolidge and his father, and John Coolidge wrote the introduction to that book. And he and John had only one letter from his father in his introduction. Listen to it. My dear John, October 12, 1924, so he's in the White House. Some weeks ago I wrote you a letter. You made no response to it, whatever. When I send you some instructions, I want to know that you are carrying them out. Now, I want to know how much time you are spending in Northampton. This is when he's in Ambrose. I would like to know what entertainments you are attending and who you are taking with you there in Ambrose. I want you to keep in mind that you have been sent to college to work. Nothing else will do any good. Nobody in my class who spent their time in other ways has ever amounted to anything. Unless you want to spend time working, you may just as well leave college. <laughs> Nothing else will make you a man or gain you the respect of people. I want you to refuse all requests that will interfere with your doing the work that is assigned each day for you to do. Your father, Calvin Coach. <laughs> That's tied close to that palsy wellsy remark. <laughs> yeah. Well. Later, I went to you, work for UVM and Jeffords, and then uh, a man in Woodstock, some of you remember him, Frank Teagle. Yeah. Frank Teagle started the Coolidge, really got the Coolidge Foundation going here. And he hired Sally Thompson, who was a friend of my mother's. And uh, they had a one room office in Woodstock, and they got the Coolidge Foundation uh, going. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget. Sally called me when I was a reporter one day. She said, Howard, I think I found the cellar hole where the Coolidge is settled. They came in the 1780s, I think. And I said, I'll be right over, Sally. So I drove over to Plymouth. She had a map and a compass. We drove down by Echo Lake, parked the car, and we headed up. It was a hot day. Oh, God, it was hot. <laughs> then we were battling through black red bushes, probably an hour. We stumbled up through the up the hill here, by God, we found this cellar hole. <laughs> and Sally said, it, Eric, this must be it. And so I said, well, let's look around. We walked around the other side, and there was a rose that came right up. <laughs> <laughs> and a side that said, go and sell it. So I got on, uh, and Frank Tingle put me on the Coolidge board. I was on that board for 20 years. Mimi, I, I got Mimi Baird on the board, and she was president for years. Bob Stafford was president. Susan Webb, do you remember Susan Webb? Yep. Her uh, grandfather was Oliver Otis Howard, Howard, the Civil War general. I was vice president for years. I would not, I wouldn't accept being president. That's a rich person. <laughs> I, I, I found out you can run a board from vice president. You use your head. And I insisted that we do the 75th connect, uh, anniversary of the Homestead inaugural instead of the 100th. Because I wanted John to be there. And he was in his 90s. And we did it at 2.47 in the morning. And he was there. And I was there that night, and I took a nap in one of the cabins, and came around the corner about an hour before the reenactment started. And I, 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 I was blown away because I turned the corner by the store, and that street looked like 19, 
point. Everybody was in costume, the old cars were there. It was like, it was amazing, it was magic. Um, of course, Coolidge's father swore him in because he was just for the peace. Somebody asked him why he thought he could do it. He said, nobody told me I couldn't. <laughs> That's Coolidge. <laughs> Incidentally, that night, uh, John told me a wonderful story about that night, historic night. The housekeeper at the Coolidge's for years and years and years, a woman named Aurora Pierce, who became nationally famous. She was a tough old bird. Uh, never married. She, when, when, she, when the president and his family were sitting around the table, when it came time for her to mock, she mocked. <laughs> and she slapped around, and if you didn't get your feet out of the way, you got your ankles banged. And she wouldn't allow electricity in the house. She wouldn't allow a telephone. She ran the place. Well, the night of the uh, of the uh, Homestead inaugural, uh, a woman named Bessie would stay at the house to help with the extra work. The VP would be out, some friends, and so the word comes from uh, from Bridgewater. And uh, John Coolidge gets the word, and so they set up the swearing in. And uh, the old man goes up and tells his son that uh, Harding has died, and so. But they forget to tell Aurora and Bessie, <laughs> who are in the bedroom past the Coolidge's, Grace and John. Grace and Calvin, excuse me. And it wasn't until the ceremony was over that John Coolidge remembered those two women up there. So he went up, knocked on their door, explained to them what had happened, and apologized. And Bessie was laying there in bed with a smile on her face, and she said, that's all right, Mr. Coolidge, we'll be there next time. <laughs> That's a good line, I'll tell you. Uh, I, I lived, uh, by the way, in North Shrewsbury for nine years, right up near Pierce's store. You know what that is? Yeah. And uh, the four Pierce's, Marjorie, Mary, and Gordon, and London, were some of my closest, closest friends I ever had that ran that store. And their first cousin was Aurora. And they were also first cousin of Midge Aldrich, who owned the tea room and the little shop right across the street from the store there. And uh, uh, Marjorie, I was over in Plymouth one day with Marjorie, and she was telling me stories about Aurora. And Aurora used to sell little jars of uh, maple uh, sugar to tourists who would come to the, to the home there, you know? And you know, and one of the tourists, uh, when Marjorie was there, came up to Aurora and said, well, how do I get this out of the jar? You know, it's solidified in there, you know? And the Lord, Aurora took it, looked at it, looked at the tourist and said, you take a spoon and you dig it out. <laughs> <laughs> that was Aurora. <laughs> Aurora, John Coolidge used to come to North Shrewsbury every summer to see the Pierces and to put flowers on Aurora's grave. The Pierce, all the Pierces, Aurora and Jim and Liz Jeffers are buried in the north of the cemetery. I can't go in there without crying. Dear, dear friend, of course I didn't know Aurora. Oh well, I want to tell you the apple story. When I was a kid, my father taught me how to throw apples on a stick. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever done it? You take a stick off an apple tree, long thin stick, and you sharpen it, and you take an apple about that big, and you stick it on, and you learn it, and you whip it, and it'll go forever. <laughs> my father taught me that, and I did all, you know, as a kid, you know. And, well, I showed Bill Jenny over site supervisor over there one day how to do it. 
And he said, would you come on the, the fourth and, and teach people how to do that? <laughs> and I said, sure. So I came down, and there were apple trees behind the school of Homestead. So I set up out there, and John, uh, uh, Bill made an announcement. And so I had about 30 people out there, and we all got sticks, you know, and sharpened them. And, and it takes a lot of practice before you catch on to it. And most of them, you know, were throwing, and the, either the apple wouldn't come off. You know, that's a more apples to go five or ten feet. But then, you know, you, you begin to catch on. And you know where John lived. He lived, as you stand behind the homestead there, you look across the field, and that's John's home which is an addition that, is, that the president put onto the homestead there. And then when the state got hold of it and, and wanted to bring it back to the way it was when he was president, they, they moved that addition out there in the field and became the Coolidge homestead. So I'm up there with apples flying every which way. And all of a sudden, John's with me. Gold now. Dang. He comes up beside me, and he said, how are you? He pointed to the pond between the homestead and their place. He said, how are you? You see those geese down there? <laughs> you think you could aim at them for me? <laughs> of course, geese will mess up anything. You know, so I, I was the only one that could reach them, but I didn't hit any. So I didn't try that hard. Anyway, I love Plymouth much. I love going to the meetings there. All seasons of the year, particularly in the morning, how it gleamed. One night there, and my wife and I gave him some money to fix up the old fireplace behind Midge's place so we could cook out there. We raised a some beers to the uh, we dedicated them. and by God out of the corner of my eye I saw Midge Alberts watch from her watch from her house to that little stand. I swear to God I did. There she was. I ran right over but she was gone. I knew Midge pretty well. Uh, Plymouth is a triumph of preservation. Do you know that once that hillside that, that dominates the notch up there was going to be covered with condos? Now they come, they, I don't know how they stopped it. I think it was Frank Teagle. When I served on the Civil War Sites Commission, we found out that any American historical site that is not firmly protected will be lost. It's true of fear, absolutely. Toward the end of my service on the foundation, a man named Peter Hannaford came to the foundation. He was Ronald Reagan's chief speechwriter. And he wanted to put a presidential library in Plymouth office. And I asked Meany Baird, who was president, to put me in charge of this. Hannaford and I had lunch up in Montpelier. And I heard him out. And I said, we will not tolerate a presidential library in Plymouth Mott. It would overwhelm him. We couldn't. It, it would ruin one of knowledge. How about Ludlow? Why am I still there? Now, can you move the little books? Maybe? <laughs> for, uh, that's the last we heard of him. <laughs> I do remember that uh, I asked Hannaford over lunch how senile Reagan was when he was president. Hannaford said, I won't answer that question, but he said, I will tell you that I visited him a month after he went back to California, and he was talking about the White House, and he pointed to a model of the White House up on his, his, in his library because he couldn't remember the name of the building. Anyway. That was the beginning, I think, Peter Hannaford's uh, coming to us of the right-wing uh, move on Plymouth, which continues to this day. The uh, head guru up there at Plymouth now, 
I saw an interview with her not long ago saying that Coolidge might even have been a better president than Ronald Reagan. It wasn't even close. <laughs> Reagan was one of the worst, started the downhill slide for the far conservative uh, right that, that saw the Bushes and Trump in the White House. Donald Pence visited Plymouth Notch, wouldn't have visited with the old foundation, I'll tell you. <laughs> the Coolidge Foundation's gone now. A friend of mine years ago was the great economist John Kenneth Galbraith. He once said to me of Reaganomics, he defined Reaganomics, feed the horse enough oats and enough may pass through to feed the sparrow on the street. <laughs> Galbraith only wrote 47 books. His son, Peter, is one of my best friends. I gave uh, three July 4th speeches at the cemetery up at Plymouth. When my hold on that uh, broke, Peter gave the next speech. And he talked about the kellogg Briog Pact that, that, that Coolidge got passed when he was president. <coughs> it, was a, it was a treaty to end wars forever. Wow! Unbelievable. Of course it didn't work. <laughs> but what a try. I mean, oh my God. Anyway. There was a touch of the progressive in Calvin Coolidge. I've got a quote here from Sheldon Stern, historian down at the Kennedy Library. Coolidge obviously believed in private enterprise, limited government and economy, but his commitment to public service, civic participation, and democratic education has been completely overlooked. His speeches and writings warn eloquently of the dangers of materialism, selfishness, and intolerance to the survival of democratic institutions, absolutely. Of course, he rose to national fame <laughs> Fighting a union, that, that's all right. His was the age of the flapper when he was president. In jazz, the country was having a good time. But in the White House, it was silent cap. Knowledge was, I think, a fairly good president. He presided in an era of prosperity. Though Grace Coolidge is quoted as saying that Coolidge said at the end of his presidency, Papa thinks there's going to be a depression. No, but we don't know for sure whether he ever said that. If he did, that kind of changes. Silent Cal, well, he gave more speeches than any one of his predecessors. <laughs> Listen to this. Coolidge spoke at Boston's Copley Plaza. when he was governor of Massachusetts. <clears throat> His wife was in the audience. She had to move behind a post to conceal her laughter. <laughs> Listen to this. Coolidge quoted from a poem, a popular poem called Gradati. The phrases painfully emphasized the Yankee claim of a man who was to pronounce the words C-O-W, cow, as if it had four syllables. <laughs> Here's what he said, and what said Grace in the, in the hysterics. Heaven is not reached at a single bale, but we build a ladder by which we rise from the lowly earth to the vaulted skies. Then we map to its summit realm by realm. It was just perfect to catch that Vermont accent of his. Well, and Coolidge held more press conferences than any of his predecessors. He used the radio wisely, he used it smartly, and he traveled and spoke. I agree. He spoke, he loved, he was a civil war. All speaking of Civil War times. I caught up with him. But, uh, I find markers to his speeches in Civil War times.
Coolidge, at the end of his presidency, came to Northampton, retired to Northampton, an unwell man. In the last year of his presidency, he had had his doctor check his heart twice a day. He knew he was sick. He came home, and as he had tried to do with the, in Washington, he tried to sit on the front porch of his house in Northampton. And as he was retired, he tried to sit on the porch of the White House in a rocking chair. <laughs> of course, the tourists just, and, and in, Massas, in Massasoit Street, it was flooded with tourists. He had to go inside. So he and his wife bought a house out in the woods near Northampton. But he didn't like lonely. They still came to Plymouth to see his father, and then when his father died, they still came up to, to uh, vacation. He got a job writing a newspaper column for $200,000 a year. <laughs> Made a lot of money. He didn't last long. He died of a massive heart attack in 1940 at the age of 60. The funeral was held in, the, in their church in Northampton. The body was brought to Plymouth. He loved Plymouth. Once, when he was governor, he was asked if he would retire to Plymouth. And there was a long, long pause, and he said, I love the hills. He once wrote of Plymouth Notch, it was all a fine atmosphere in which to raise a boy. As I look back on it, I constantly think how clean it was. There was little about it that was artificial. It was all close to nature and in accordance with the ways of nature. The streams ran clear, the woods, the roads, the people, all were clean. Even when I try to divest it of the halo, which I know always surrounds the past, I am, I am unable to create any other impression than, in the, than that it was fresh and clean. Edward Whiting of the Boston Record wrote of the notch, an hour or two in Plymouth explains the disposition of silence of Coolidge. It is an inspiring country in the majesty of its hills and in the tremendous silence. To go to Plymouth is to rediscover this country. The funeral was in Northampton. The Coolidge pew was vacant. Funeral procession came up the Connecticut Valley. Hundreds of people were at, at every hamlet and road crossing, standing silently in the rain. At the notch, sleet was falling, and it had whitened the mountains. He was buried next to his mother and father and son. Taps played to end the brief service. Then a ray of sun broke through and touched the whitened mountains. The boy had returned. The boy had returned the man to the town where he grew up. If you remember when I began this talk, which is about to end, <coughs> I mentioned Coolidge's going with his father uh, to Bennington in 1891 for the dedication of the monument. Coolidge went back to Bennington in the last year of his presidency in 1928. He was on his way from Plymouth to Washington. The train stopped there. People knew we were coming. And he gave a short speech. I'll close with that. I could not look upon the peaks of Escutney, Killington, Mansfield, and Equinox without being moved in a way that no other scene could move me. It was here that I first saw the light of day. Here I received my bride. Here my dead lie pillowed on the loving breast of our everlasting hills. I love Vermont because of her hills, valleys, her scenery, and her invigorating climate, but most of all because of her people. 
They are a race of pioneers who have almost beggared themselves in the service of others. If the spirit of liberty should banish from other parts of our union and the support of our institutions languish, it could all be replenished from the generous store held by the people of the brave little state of Vermont. Vermonters. <laughs> Thanks for listening.